just. No, I don't think I'm not. Oh, you're not. Sure, sure. Marty. Marty. You got an agenda list. I do. I didn't want to look at the agenda. Bob said. We have uh, our sports and rec person here, and um, that would be you, Marty. Yep. Yeah. So let's go ahead and let's hear from you. Is this what you ready? Say? Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Mayor. Um, yeah, I put this uh, together for our department. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. It just uh, says a little about our uh, story, our staff. We're actually missing our rec assistant maintenance right now, but in the process of uh, filling that, uh, the, the applications have went out and closed. So I think uh, Donald will be setting up interviews for that position. Uh, yeah, if you have any questions on like the facility management strategies, please feel free to ask. I'm going to go into the projects. Uh, Try to keep it as short as possible. Um, first of all, I'd just like to talk about a few of the projects that we have completed. Of course, our heating system. We've got a new heating and air system we completed in uh, 2018. Your air system. Yeah. Really good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we completed that project. We also completed the baseball fields. Uh, that was completed in 2019. Uh, Ready for 2020 play, of course, COVID hit, so we all know how that went. Um, we were able to resurface our pool, uh, resurface our gym floor. So all the monies that we've put in for through our department, we've, we've used, we've spent them. We, we were able to complete all the projects that we've put in for. Um, and i just like to say the importance of CIP money, marijuana funds, lottery they all help in these projects so they're very important uh to us and they've uh they enabled us to do these projects um uh, projects that i have scheduled for here for the future uh new ceiling tiles they're kind of an eyesore we'd like to get those done uh i have costs there uh i think which are close to right uh replace the aerobic room flooring and they're all dated by year up until 2025 and close outdoor pool which there's already I think council approved 1.2 million dollars for uh, a sprinkler system community center is very old uh, and remodel this meeting room which gets used tremendous use uh, and the kitchen. I think uh, us being a Red Cross provider and as much as we house up here with given vaccinations, uh, if there's a snowstorm, that those things need to be upgraded and improved. Um, and basically that's all I have. I have a total cost at the bottom. <coughs> and if uh, council has any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer. The one question that comes, I'm not sure, you know, we had a presentation the other night at our regular meeting about the tennis courts. Is that something that you are responsible for to maintain, or is that normal? That, um, that's been done. The trees have been cut. That, that's our uh, parks and maintenance. Okay. Uh, just and, and it's taken care of. Okay. <coughs> well, only other question, Mark, is on the swimming pool enclosure. Uh, that's a, that's a, that's a, is that going to... Uh, be feasible to work out. I mean, we're going to have to hire other people. Lifeguard is going to be open all the time, and well, are, and you know, taking care of. Is it going to be worthwhile to the spend that kind of money for? Well, there are there around? are going to be pros and cons to it. it right. It'll be accessible to the public year round, which is a good thing. Uh, but then closing it is going to incur more cost mm -hmm. uh, because you're going to have to staff it year round. Right. Um, there's ways to do it. I mean, Jared ran the one over in Raton, and there are ways to do it. I guess you don't open all the time. You, you do what's feasible where you find out you're busy, like give an open swim time, a lap swim, a family time, and you won't have to hire as much staff in the winter. Um, 
but and, and another con is the humidity in there. Right. Now you have a big cost of trying to get rid of that hot air that ruins a lot of things in indoor pools. It's it's just one of the things you battle with an indoor pool. Right. Um, but it was it was it was a top go getter on the the deal they sent out to the public on a survey that that's what they wanted. It was it was it was the number one thing they wanted was a all year round indoor pool. Um, I'd like to investigate a little bit on doing a retractable roof so that you can keep the outdoor aspect of the pool yes. in the summer. I think mm -hmm. that's important uh, to me, and plus it would help with the humidity. Yes. You can open up, slide that roof open, or sliding doors if we can't get the, the, uh, the retractable part, but I think that would be a great number one thing statewide. It would be a good destination for people to come. Well, yes, ma'am. Does the pool have to be heated to be enclosed? I mean, to be usable in the winter, does the pool have to be heated? Yeah, there will have to be some heat in it. Yes, ma'am. Is it heated now at all? The, the pool? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's heated. The water will always be heated. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we have a boiler that heats the pool. Okay. Keeps it around 82 degrees, so it's very warm. Okay. Yep. Um, Marty, if you do something like that, would it be feasible to talk to the school districts? Because one of the things that... Uh, the school district need, I think, uh, is a swimming team. Are you talking to, hey, that might be something that would help offset some of that cost, maybe? Possibly. Um, the, the only thing about this pool, though, is it's not regulation swim meet. Right. Yeah. Like, it's, it's only 75 meters long because it was <coughs> built for, with everything in mind, with a zero entry, a slide with a plunge pool and six, uh, I think, five lap lanes. So it's not built regulation for swim meets, but it's something that they still may be able to practice in, just having to go a little further. Well, it's, I think that would be something to look at because you know, they're always talking about what what else can the community use overall for the school. I mean, for the school system, and I'm not sure if they'd be. I'm sure it. I'm sure it's going to come up, Mayor. It's actually a great idea because I'm sure if that happens, there's going to be interest in it. Well, you know, in addition to that, just teaching kids how to swim, integrated during the school year and the school day. I mean, a thousand years ago when I was in high school, that was a mandated course yes. for uh, safety. Don't. <laughs> they had to spend so much money to repair. Remember the junior high? Did that yeah. happen in the pool? Yeah, a of, well, a lot of the heating elements. Twenty years ago, we shut down the pool at the uh, oh, the old high school, Trinidad Middle School. Yeah. He heating elements, it just the cost was just ridiculous. They'd go out, and you'd have to purchase, you know buy more elements and so they just decided to use it as storage now. Yeah. What would uh, the amount of personnel needed to staff that pool year well, round? I, I you, think has anybody thought about that? Well I think your summers would remain the same around fourteen uh, seasonal employees. Winter I think it'll cut down to probably you could get by with six, eight. No, I'm just curious what Yeah. Um, if we had ever thought yeah. about what we need to do for it. But we could generate revenue. Yeah, because we need to offset, offset some of that. Yeah. The pool right now is doing really well. It, it, it might be one of those years where that pool breaks even, which okay. usually doesn't happen a lot. It, it's usually just an amenity, you know, for the people. But it's really doing well. They're really enjoying it. Well, you know, I hear all the time, we probably all do, that there are people that go over to Raton. Yeah. And you're, you probably saw that. So I think that that's something that we would, you know, we would bring people back here to. Exactly, Mayor. And that is, I think, one of the reasons uh, that they wanted it so much, because a lot of people do go over to Raton and use their pool, their facility. I'd say 50% <coughs> of the lap swimmers that were going over there were from Trinidad. Yeah. So have a year around. You definitely keep your lap swimmers over here. But Valentine, do you see any... John Paul's from something like this? Because I know that's always been kind of a question. Yeah, and 
The whole discussion is, that it's what it is. A pool is not going to make money. It's not for money making. It's amenity for the community. Um, like Marty says, your hope is to break even or fall just a little bit over. Uh, you know. And with it comes a lot of maintenance when you yep. close all that chlorine. Um, <coughs> so, uh, Marty, you see, I, you know, it seems like since I've been on council, it seems like every year just to start up a, a swimming pool, there always seems to be some components that kind of are hay, on haywire or whatever. Do you think that being able to operate it on a year-round basis, there would be less upkeep in, 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 that, in some of these particular areas where freezes don't happen and all this other stuff? In certain parts of the equipment, yes, because that equipment and that pumps and that boiler is meant to run. Sitting for nine months out of the year is not good for it. If you're running it, it's going to run a lot better, and your maintenance issues on those types of things are going to be less because that equipment's meant to run. And when you sit it in cold weather that long of time, you go out to start them up, pumps are froze. Boilers got rust built up in it. Uh, burners, you, you got to pull it apart and clean it. With it running, that they're meant to run. Then uh, big boilers and pumps, they're, they're meant to run. Well, you know, with Jared being on staff, you know, he, he's got some... In depth knowledge, it sounds like of what it takes to operate that pool. Well, an advantage is pools are engineered to have water in them. Water pushes out on the walls, is being pushed in by the dirt. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so, as soon as you take the water out of the pool, all the walls start pushing in on it, and you start having stress fractures and cracks and all that kind of issue. So, having a year round pool, or that's what it's designed to. That water helps your pool's longevity. You don't deal with cracks, you don't deal with those things of thaws and freezes and thaws and freezes. So there's a substantial increase in cost to an indoor pool. You got an HVAC system, you're gonna be putting chemicals in that pool year round, you know, nine more months instead of three more months. But in the longevity of the life of the pool, it's better to have water in there as a year round pool year. Yeah, I agree with that. Right now, when do you shut it down? What We'll shut it down probably end of August. Okay. The, the reason for my question there is that with all of this recreation that we are building up in the community, we will have more people coming into the community, more people will be able to utilize it year-round as they do come into the community. We can advertise that, that it's available, so there are some possibilities there for additional revenue. Yeah, and I think that's the reason behind trying to get something like that is to try to stay ahead of the game and give the community something that's there instead of scraping when they're already here. To get a start on this now, I think, would be the plan. Uh, well, I know that was kind of kind of low on the totem pole to some extent uh, for council, but I think it's something that you know, just to continue to take a good hard look at it to see. It comes to the, on all the surveys we do, it comes to the top. Yep. Uh, indoor pool. I have a question. So I saw in your, in your plans the aerobics room, the floor for the aerobics room. So I, I'm kind of lacking in knowledge on how the community center re generates revenue. So if you have somebody in here doing like a private Pilates class or whatever, do you charge for those? Or yes, if it's private, we do. Um, the only thing, the only ones we don't do not charge are the nonprofits. Like the ladies like to come up here and have a sewing group. Okay. That we don't charge for that. But if somebody's doing something for profit, profit charging people, then we do charge them. Yeah. Do you think the you said the uh, community center is pretty well utilized? Yes. It was before COVID. We're just starting to get it back now. Really? Yeah. And people are starting to come back to us now with their, uh, that used to be here all the time. The kids are coming back to play pickup games. Uh, people are calling to start volleyball leagues, basketball leagues. Yeah, we're starting to get it back, but we, we really took a hit too. Yeah. Now, the, the fees 
Jerry, being that you come from the one in that tone compared to what we're the charging fees for the usage, are they comparable, less, more? What, what I, I don't know what, what Marty charges over there. <clears throat> we didn't, there were, we did two options depending on how the program was. We would charge a flat rate, just a, a rental fee for whatever it is they wanted to use. And depending on what it was, it was 50, 100 bucks. Or we did an 80, 20 percentage where they would charge their whatever fees and then we would take uh, 20 percent of that which sometimes for smaller groups it was better for them because they didn't have to come up with a, a big fee up front it would help them get their program going and established and then once they were then we would charge them a flat rental fee for whatever room they were using and it worked out pretty good depending on you know because we didn't want to charge someone so much that then they wouldn't be able to do the program at all because we had overcharged them in just the rental of the facility. But once they became established, then... They, we do it the exact same way. They start, they want to start a yoga class. We'll see, we'll let them build the class. If they have three people, up to four, five people, it's a certain amount. Up to ten people, it's a second amount, and so on. Um, they, they do fees for individuals. Are there any charges that you're charging now for individuals? If we don't charge individuals to come and play basketball. No, I'm talking about the swimming pool. Oh yes, it's three dollars per person. We have uh, we have a 10, 10 punch pass. We have a thirty punch pass. And if they want a sixty, they just get two thirties. Okay. We have those available. And then pool parties are pool parties are one hundred and thirty dollars for two hours. Okay, is that comparable to what they're charging? In yeah, we were, our day pass was five dollars uh, for a day, and then we had a one month, six month, three month, and year membership pass. We also had the punch pass, and we did twenty visits per with sixty dollars. We actually raised it eighty dollars for twenty visits or thirty visits. They got a bit of a discount. They bought punch passes, and it was uh, one twenty five for two hours in the party room. So there's an opportunity for increase in revenue. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anything else, Marty? Nope, that's that's all I got. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Thank you for yeah, your hospitality. You're, you're very welcome. How much would you charge me for this group? Uh, <laughs> I think so. One thirty five. Yeah. 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 Discount. Okay, outdoor recreation. Jared, what do you got? Um, well, with a brand new department with no budget, it's easy to talk about. The sky's the limit, or there's nothing to talk about, but uh, mostly right now, um, what the Office of Outdoor Recreation is doing is a lot of planning. Um, we're wrapped up in a, in a bunch of different things. We kind of have, I say we, but I, uh, in different, uh, different projects. Um, our trail project right now, we're working with uh, TSC, or TS, formerly TSJC, and Tony Boone with some worm trail or wormhole developments. Um, the class is kind of taking a break from some projects on Fisher's Peak and are uh, involved in some uh, design work over there, so we're, we're helping them with that. We met with the National Park Service here on Thursday to uh, restart our old Sopras Trail which the more history I get from that, the more <laughs> I understand how far back that project goes. But we're going to try to restart that and uh, work on a trail from from town to the lake. And um, so we're in conversations. Um, hopefully the National Park Service, through their River Trails and Conservation Assistance Grant, will help us uh, get that gym started again. Um, the council just approved the, uh, the grant for the uh, lighting or the continuation of the lighting of the river walk from the waterworks building down to um, the dog park. I guess that's down to Linden. So we're hoping to be able to, with that grant, light that portion of the river walk and uh, make that a more usable amenity for folks, folks wanting to, uh, as they say there at the Welcome Center, we promote this beautiful river walk, but we don't light it at night where people, which having walked it myself as part of the grant to see how scary it is, it's sufficiently scary about <laughs> 9 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't promote any unless we don't want to have 
have our visitor come back and go down there by yourself. <laughs> so uh, hopefully that gets awarded. That has, a, I believe it's a six-month or eight-month turnaround. We have to have that project completed from the time we're funded. So that would be a, a quick project that would really kind of, uh, for lack of no pun intended, light up our uh, our, our efforts <laughs> in uh, improving our recreation amenities. Um, Working with, with Bob and uh, Public Works uh, to designate our bike route and our bike lanes. That was a, a project that Wally had kind of spearheaded. We had a grant for 25000 from DOT, was it? To uh, designate uh, bike routes and put in some bike lanes. And so um, we've got word back from DOT that that's a go. So we're going to be working on that. Connecting all our, our rec amenities uh, around with bike lanes and bike paths which is a pretty popular thing to have that as part of our infrastructure. Um, just went out for RFP for the Waterworks Building for uh, Engineering, Architectural, and Landscape Design. It is my uh, ambition to see that converted into the Center for Outdoor Recreation for the City of Trinidad and uh, the home office of the, the Office of Outdoor Recreation right there along the river rock right by the river. Um, and have that as uh, our focal point as we try to encourage more recreation and try to uh, steer our economy into a, an outdoor recreation focused economy. I think that'd be a nice landmark to have in the middle of town as our uh, center for outdoor recreation. Um, spending a lot of conversations with uh, Mr. Shoemaker and the Greenway Foundation. Um, he is quite the character, as I think anybody who's had a chance to visit with Jeff, um, always the entertainer. Uh, so lots of conversations going on there. We are probably halfway through the visioning process. Uh, they plan to have deliverables by the end of the year, I think is when they wanted to have. So we have a couple more meetings coming up. Um, so more private meetings, there'll probably be a couple more uh, public input meetings, but that is, is on the way. And, um, he is very well connected individual, and so he um, he's got some good influence with GoCo, and so hopefully with his influence here, we'll have a little more GoCo influence in the area, and maybe be able to, to make some good connections there. Um, Lifetime Fitness is still on board to come down with the T Rad Dirt Fest, um, the very end of the Santa Fe Trail commemoration. Um, they are wrapped up right now in all the Leadville races, so they're kind of ignoring me, but I've tried to reach out to them to see how many registrations we already have. Um, they are promising 800 to 1,000 uh, folks coming that first weekend in October, which just from the marketing they're doing right now alone um, is really going to put Trinidad, um, Trinidad on the map as a, a gravel grinding uh, adventure race destination. So that is a very big feather in our hat as we move forward. Um, we've got sand volleyball and disc golf. We're working on revamping the disc golf out here from an eight or from a nine hole to an eighteen hole. Um, with that completion of that and the disc golf out there at, towards Bon Carbo, the twin seaters. Plus the two that are in right home, we would have four 18-hole disc golf courses within 20 miles of each other, which would really then put us in the disc golf world. Folks would. You get a lot of usage on there right now. Um, he gets a lot of usage out there. We, not to disparage anybody who developed this one here, but it doesn't get ranked very high. Like in the disc golf world, it's kind of you have the bottom, and then you have. A layer of yucky stuff, and then that that one is right, right here. So we're going to make this one a whole lot better. Yeah, they play it, but it's usually your young people because it's a rough, tough course, and I think that's why it's that way. There's yeah. no flat part to it. Yeah, it's except down here. There may be what Jared tools, tools. Yeah. yeah, that's it. That's it. Otherwise, you're a these kids body. come. Some from Oklahoma, they they tell me they come like once, twice a year just to play this, but they're young. This isn't for everybody. Yeah, yeah. So we're going to make it a much more accessible. Two separate nine holes can get together in 18 hole and uh, try to improve our rankings in the disc golf world as far as this course and make it more attractive. As long as we don't need to add water to it. No, there's no, that's the beauty about disc golf. 
people think those things are. I, when we put one in in Raton, I had people thinking that I was working with game and fish for some bird trap, and we were doing a bird study. And that was those, <laughs> those baskets were out there. So those are disc golf baskets, and that's where you throw your disc into. So we're going to work on on that. Um, working with the tourism board to develop uh, some marketing. Um, Trinidad True Outdoors. They have, or they, we, the city of Trinidad has a billboard in Castle Rock, an electronic billboard. Um, that they are wanting to use to promote outdoor recreation. So I've been working with them to kind of give them some, some outdoor recreation ads to use. And what that actually does is, I think it changes every 15 or 30 seconds. Yeah. There's a new item in. Yeah. They, they went ahead and contracted for another period of time. And uh, there's an unlimited amount of what kind of information would be put in there. So uh, when they did decided to do that, it, it, it's great. It'll be good. It'll be good. Um, so, constant relations with uh, CPW and Fisher's Peak and the development going on out there um, on some different focus committees as they as CPW begins. Well, not begins. They're part way through their planning public uh, year long master planning process. So, some of those conversations are enlightening, and some of those conversations are extremely boring. But we have our finger in that pie. <laughs> make sure that we're re represented there. Um, and then the process of all this developing a, a website, promote our outdoor recreation uh, amenities, our programs, our events, uh, it's called TrinidadTrueOutdoors.com. It's still in the, the planning space, so I haven't really made it too much public other than right now. But if you want to kind of take a peek at it, it's TrinidadTrueOutdoors.com. And as that gets more developed, then it'll become more readily available. Are you going to be able to integrate that with the city's website? Yes. So it's it's off the books right now just for like ADA compliance issues right now. So it's not, we're not causing any issues, but we will at some point marry that all together. So along with that, um, the four pillars of the Office of Outdoor Recreation is one to inventory all the recreation assets. I, I like to have a regional approach, um, not because we are a region, there's a lot of recreation opportunities that exist in New Mexico that I think we can, uh, I don't know if we can exploit, but use to uh, <laughs> our benefit to promote Trinidad. And so I promote within a, an hour and a half travel radius, so from the sand dunes south to like Springer Lake area, uh, Mount Maxwell Wildlife Refuge, Cuchara, Romejo. There really isn't much out this direction, so I don't talk much about out that direction. But if anybody has anything, Pinion Canyon is included. Pinion Canyon has some cool recreation opportunities that um, no one really talks about. That so inventorying our assets, inventorying the rec programs that are going on, and I was surprised at how many organizations are doing outdoor recreation programming. Um, Mount Carmel has some cool stuff going on, 4-H, there's just some individual groups, the school guides, which was something cool that I know, just the group that goes and rides bikes around town, um, so compiling those things and then some of the different events, including the Pony Express 160, the high-low gravel grind out there that um, the Christine Loudon puts on, I don't know if that's who it is. Um, so getting all those events that are going on and kind of putting them all together in a way to promote all of those things and then just an effort to market the program, the assets, and the events um, all coming out of Trinidad, Colorado, which I consider the hub for outdoor recreation for Southern Colorado and Northeastern New Mexico. And that's all my lies. I've been told them all. Uh, one thing I want to mention, too, is that we you know, keep talking about the, the river walk. And, uh, a lot of that vegetation right off the edge, of course, that was the reason why we purchased that equipment and working with uh, public works to like said, it, make it less scary. Yes, I guess it, absolutely. That's something that I think that we, uh, you guys can work on to try to get going. Yeah, that's part of the lighting project is right. to open that up. So, in conversations with uh, the police chief and the Water Partnership to open up that corridor and get rid of the herbaceous species and be able to look from the trail down to the river. It was all part of, of Jeff's 
master plan of connecting people to the river and, and better access and is uh, <coughs> there's a couple of spots along I think there it's right behind the uh, the current uh, animal shelter mm -hmm. or it used to be a trash dump a trash dump at one point I don't know if that is Julie Kalitson's project or would that be something that our probably part of be kind of in tandem with Julie and, and her, her group is down there once a month and then they're doing they're doing great work because I see that and you can see it snuffs off yeah. every now and then you can see new trash. Yeah. 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 Are there any programs that you're specifically targeting to youth? Not right yet. It is one of my down the road goals once the department gets established is to Promote the youth program that already exists for, from whatever agency or whatever <coughs> coming out, but then for the department to develop some of its own, you know, whether it be hiking programs or introduction to mountain biking programs or stuff like that to engage those younger people so that as they grow up, they have those lifelong outdoor recreation activities where, in comparison to, you know, Marty there, where you you can't play football your whole life. You can't play baseball. Your, you know some of those activities that are you feel the age as you grow. You know you can always ride a bike. It's always easy to go paddle a kayak or a canoe. And those are some of those lifetime, long life uh, recreation activities that people enjoy for their whole life. So that's what we're we'll start them young and hopefully keep them all the way through. But yes, ma'am. I, I had a, a friend who moved to town, um, and she has children who are young adult and teenager and she was trying to find things for them to do this summer and was really having a hard time. And I wondered, Marty, if we've ever had a kids summer camp that meets at the community center that, you know, uses the basketball courts and the swim, it, it might be something that would be a good idea if we've never done that. We do and we have lots of other groups that do that, like the high school batch, basketball coach and volleyball coach. She has scheduled some camps up here now, um, and she does the high school, but she always does youth camps to try to keep those kids interested in the sport so that she has a feeder program. Uh, Julie Moderano with, the, with her program does basketball camps and volleyball camps, even baseball. Um, so there's, there's always somebody up here using the facility for those reasons, and then we do our own too. Mr. Valentine, let me go on and mention something that comes up, and I think this falls into your way. <laughs> Did you guys ever get ironed out the issue that goes on with uh, use of uh, Central Park baseball field? Not totally. Okay. Not totally, but um, we're working toward it, and everybody's talking, so, yeah. Okay. So, Next two thing. things, Jared. Sir. So, one, when you talk about out east, you should always keep in mind the Comanche National Grasslands, the dinosaur tracks. That hiking, that canyon in there, the, especially this year, the way the Purgatory River is running, that is just a beautiful, amazing place that nobody's ever been out there. And I can't remember the ranch and everything when you go in there, but that is phenomenal to add into stuff in this area. And the second thing is, I don't know if for the Corps engineers or the Parks and Wildlife, one built the trail now, so off of Old Sopris Road, it connects right over to the South Shore entrance to the park. You no longer have to come out on the pavement and right down to get into the park. So they connected right from the South Shore entrance all the way down to Sopris Road. They did a fabulous job. Oh, it's, it, it is amazing nice. with the rock and yeah. the gravel they put in and how that connects. So that that is uh, a, another step in the right direction connecting the Boulevard Edition out there. You know, you talked about the dinosaur tracks, and I'm not sure how many people here have ever gone up to Ludlow and gone all the way around and come back to go in there. <clears throat> I did that, my wife and I, yesterday. But as you go past the Ludlow uh, massacre site there and go back a few miles, you know, some of the old coal mines, and I think that's something the county should be able to designate some landmarks for mm -hmm. and additional stuff that you're talking about, you know, the history of the community of the area where we can add to market these Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> you all have a fabulous day. I'm getting back at it. All right. Let's get back You're welcome. Okay. Public works. Mr. Jeff, you're on.
You can't read it. Yes, I can. He did too. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Now is it Bob just turn? <laughs> just now. Yeah. yeah. Sir. yeah. He used to be just Bob, Bob. Now it's just Mr. Just. Thank you, sir. I'm very, sir. I'm very well. Good to see you, Bob. I know, Bob. Good to see you. This is a supplemental. I don't know if it made it to the original. Uh, two reps that I want to share with you. Yeah. Anytime we talk engineering, it's scary. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, All we do is look at numbers when we see that. So, yeah, I'd like to start off by, you know, as you know, we added two exceptional employees when we lost uh, the existing employee back in December. Uh, um, Nate Eaton and uh, 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 Quint Nikolai. So the, the engineering department's been a, a, a huge, uh, that was a huge boost for us. And we've been able to, a lot of uh, this work that we were consulting with outside consultants, we're all doing that in-house, both design and the inspection. Right now we're, we're scrambling because we have a lot of projects. But anyway, uh, I assume... This part of it, uh, Kimberly told me you guys had this, the part on engineering uh, in the timeline. Is that right, Mike? Sure. Yeah. It, it's in there. Okay. Um, it's in their spreadsheet. Okay. So okay. I just, this handoff that I gave you is just kind of a more of a breakdown of engineering because uh, we have a lot of projects that are currently under design right now and we're kind of seeking priorities for whatever you guys want, you feel is the most important. And, and these aren't marked by any way by priority. So once you guys have a chance to listen to it and digest it, then you can maybe come back to us and say, you know, we really feel that this project is, is, has a higher priority over the other one. But uh, the first one is a commercial street sewer. Unfortunately, we're going to be, we found another sewer line down there. And we're going to be putting in a, another manhole uh, to try and, figure out where that sewer is going because we do have sewer down there so um, Mike knows more about that than that project has always been here and existed but um, that's my understanding is once we uh, figure out that existing additional line that we found down there then we can figure out how to deal with it am I correct in saying that Mike? Yep, yep. Okay. Uh, there's more lines in the street than we then our mapping shows, and uh, through investigation, we found a line that's in dire need of replacement and uh, needed manhole. So, and we're going to books. We're tying that onto one of our uh, grants. Am I correct in saying that as well, Mike? We're trying. Okay. Uh, Main Street Improvement. That's project from Animus uh, to Nevada. Uh, yeah, Nevada or the right there at the. Where the well, four four point intersection is, um, that we've already gone out there and shot that uh, in house. We did all the preliminary topographic survey. Uh, yeah, we're going to proceed with uh, it. Would be from uh, building face to building face, so uh, curb gutters, sidewalks, street. Uh, my understanding, the infrastructure, the sewer lines already been up updated, so we're. We're ready to do the top surface on that. First street surface improvement uh, from Chestnut to Con Convent. As you know, we've gone through and replaced the water line this summer. And we're currently in the block between uh, commercial and convent. We want to come back and kind of do what we did on commercial street. We're going to utilize the brick and probably use concrete parking for the parking places. Um, that is currently the topography. Topography has been shot, and we will proceed with getting design plans together this winter and hit the hit the streets with design or construction come first thing in this, this spring, the, the spring 22. Santa Fe widening from Saddle Road to Exit 11. Uh, that's again, that's a project that we worked with uh, Talitha to get a grant. We don't have the design drawings. Done on that, we started the preliminary topo on it. 
uh, we will proceed with getting the design drawings and go out the bid with it as well. Come that would be spring as well. Garfield widening. Uh, that's a project that uh, we're going to entail the lighting that Mr. Shu has always asked us about. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think we're going to also implement a, a gas line because that way we can loop the system. Uh, there is a lot of rock on that road. So, uh, But uh, I think some of the widening we can do in-house and maybe after we get the widening done, then we can turn it over to, uh, to somebody to come in do the curb gutter and, and pavement have a, a contractor come in and do that. Uh, and if you guys have a question about any of these, just jump in anywhere. I'm just going down the list, okay? On that Santa Fe, just a question on that Santa Fe, why is the state involved in that or is that just our project? It's just our project. Okay. And that'll, state, go out, that'll go off for a bid? Yes. For, We've applied for a grant and I think right. it's a state uh, Main Street Improvement Grant, I think. But, yeah. What kind of dollar amount uh, do you apply for? Two million? Two, two or 2.5, I think. 2.5 million? Yeah. We, we, we asked for the world. Because <laughs> by then, we, you know, it may very well take that, you know. Does it include We're, curb and gutter? Curb, gutter, and sidewalk, and a new bike lane. Yeah. Bike lanes, I should say. Right. So we allocated over a million dollars, didn't we? That off the main street project kind of split that. Yeah. yeah. So that funding that you buy for is through the main street project? I think it's main street. I'm not sure. Pretty sure it's main street uh, improvements. Yeah. See that? Yes. It is. Yeah. Because they had two levels. They had two levels. Lines. We did not ask for the larger amount and then the lighting project that. Jared talked about it was a smaller. Go ahead, Bob. Continue. Okay, sorry about that. I was just going to put this on mute so that I don't interrupt this. Um, city garage drainage. I don't know if you guys ever been down there after a storm. It's a lake. Uh, we have a neighbor down there that's constantly, I don't want to say harassing us, but lets us know about it every time we do get a storm. And we do. I don't want our guys or our equipment driving through a lake to access our, our garage. So we, this is actually pretty much designed. Uh, and we're, we, we do own the property on the other side of the Chile Lee ditch that we're going to take the water from. And actually, if we can't put it in the ditch, we're going to dump it into the, the field on the other side of the ditch. So uh, it's in the works. To, we're hoping we can do a lot of that design in-house with uh, street and brick. Not design. Um, construction and then uh, uh, so we just it's just a matter of trying to figure out a time period to get it done the street bridge is swamped right now um, Kansas Avenue uh, there's uh, I met up there with some residents a, a few weeks ago and we have some drainage issues and we're gonna they're fairly easy fixes because we have that underground storms system that runs through there we can get into that fairly easy on it so we're, we're coming up with the design and we'll either most likely we'll go out to design with that we won't try to, we won't try to do that in-house the construction part of it I said design I meant construction sorry um, Cheshire Street water fill station that is as far as I know that's just about hundred percent complete we've already extended it up Chestnut to the new location um, I'm waiting on Mark V. Hill to get us a actual quote unquote whatever model of the building station he wants to use there. I think this is going to be a huge asset. I think we're going to find people. There's so many people that haul water right now, uh, domestic water. I think they're going to end up using that to haul domestic water. Not that it is, it's not potable, but it probably could be drinkable because it's coming out of our well right there. So. Uh, as far as our end of it, we're done with the design, and I'm, like I said, I'm waiting on Mark to, to give us a basically. A, on that water well, if people are going to draw water from that, are we charging them for that water? Absolutely. Be a, are you familiar with the, the, the other water dispensing stations that are throughout the city or the county? It, it, you can use a card. You can, I think some of them are cash. You just go, you, and it gives you whatever amount. So, yes, we will be. 
That thing will make money for us. Excuse me, is that the water station that's right there off of Americana Road? Oh, where the old animals? What's that? It, oh, it's right behind uh, the Toyota dealer, the yeah. number the well was between the Toyotas, yeah. Toyota and our city garage. That's that's it. And we're moving it. We've actually moved it up Chestnut, closer to uh, Plum, uh, Elm Street. It's, I haven't even noticed the medical there. You know, all it is is there's nothing. That we, all we did was extend the, the water line, the, the non potable water line, to the location where the actual water. So we worked with uh, Kip Hampton and we got a turnout. So it's going to work out nice where we can actually pull off of Chestnut. They can fill and we're not causing a traffic jam or whatnot in the middle of the road. Um, Central Park Grandstands, that's a big one. That came from our DOJ list. We're going to do the design in-house on that. There hasn't, we, there has been some conceptual drawings done by GMS, very conceptual. And, uh, but we've actually gone out, our staff has done some survey, so we are proceeding with that. And unfortunately, that is going to be an expensive project. That's, we just got to figure out how to pay for it. Maybe we can find a grant, whatnot. Bob, will that work at the Grand Sands? Will it um, address any of the water flow issues there to the north of the Grand Sands at all? Are you talking about in the parking lot or when you say north, uh, down uh, on the field? Yeah, yeah, it directs. Absolutely. We, we want to basically deal with the drainage that's on top, up in the parking area, and the drainage that's on the field. There is an existing uh, manhole, storm manhole that, that drains into the lake right now. And we're pretty positive that we think we can get all that drainage into that manhole. And then when we do the, the new infill, we're going to do some underlying uh, French drain to collect the water on it and get all that water out of there. So That'd be nice. Yeah, we, we would love to turf, uh, artificial turf the infill, be the outfield natural turf if the budget provides money-wise. Uh, that way if we get an event, it can be on it playing five minutes later. You know, it doesn't shut down the, the triggers. It doesn't shut down whoever's utilizing that facility. You asked a good question earlier. Yes, we need to work out that MOU. Uh, it's, it's on my desk. It's, it's on Mike's. We're, it, it's a difficult situation right now. Uh, everybody thinks they own that facility, and if they don't know who the actual owner is. We tried to make that real clear to them, including that batting cage. Put some signs up all the way back. <laughs> So, uh, anyway, uh, but I, it's such a beautiful park that the, the outline of the, the peak in the background, it's just, wow, what an amenity we have there. Um, this uh, water shop garage, this is a little project for Mark. He just, the uh, engineering is going to do the design, the foundation. We're going to do that in-house for his, I want to say it's a 30 by 40 steel building. It's probably, I think, for him to store, is it pipe, Mike? Is that what you're saying? It is sort of pipe, and you weren't here earlier, so we'll, we'll talk about it. And there might be a joint effort there, so, yeah. Gotcha. Uh, police Station 80A ramp. Uh, Mr. Glorioso would like a ramp to come down from the upper parking lot into his building instead of those steps. He claims that, and it is, steps are dangerous, and then... Not that we need ADA because they have ADA accessibility to the building because he can drive around. But it's more for his officers when they park on top, then they can basically walk down a ramp instead of steps. So we've already shot that, and we already have some conceptual drawings in the works on that for him. I told him it's coming out of his budget, though. <laughs> <laughs> um, LEA, ADA ramp, and outdoor seating. Uh, I think you guys have familiar with that, that we, we talked about creating a, uh, an area for people where they could sit outside and eat, kind of an outdoor food court could be utilized by anybody. Uh, we have to basically, right now it's not ADA compliable because of the large steps in the, the between the concrete. Um, so that project would make that, uh, bring it into compliance as well as provide a Amenity to people utilizing downtown. So, thinking here, we have to make sure it's well lighted. <clears throat> there is a uh, lighting on the side of uh, uh, at the pizza place right now. I think it, 
in its city lighting, but city it's lighting. surrounded on the building here. But the conduit and lighting structures are, right? Is that correct? The, yeah. the light standards are there? So basically what you're saying is try to turn that into like a community mini park, or not park, but someplace and place to use or whatever. Right. What you're trying to do with that. It, does, it doesn't matter who wants to utilize it, you know. Uses, yeah. And then, and then we still have access from the private parking lot up to Main Street. Okay. Because there was talk about selling that. And it's like, well, then if you sell it, they could completely shut it down. And now that parking lot, then you got to go around. And it's, it's nice to come up through that alley to access okay. Main Street. Mm -hmm. Mr. Jess, who owns, Mike and I were talking about this last week, who owns the property behind where SCRT is at? And Bella Luna, who owns that property between the private parking lot and right that where the bricks are at? Do we own it? Does Jay no, owns it? I think it's Jay's. It's Jay's. <clears throat> so, right up to it abuts the buildings. Bella Luna, SCRT, Manitalis all go to the back property line. Building um, line. Terabinos own the entire. Uh, area where mm -hmm. parking is, and they they so, sold that to Kit Hampton Group. Okay. So, um, way back when those sidewalks were put in, there was agreements amongst all the property owners. The city did the work, and uh, those have since lapsed. That was done in Trinidad tomorrow, downtown tomorrow. Uh, Mr. Passarelli was on, was a Planner or council or that, that long ago. So, yep. But we'll work something out because they, that needs some work. It's bad. Yes. Really yes. Those big trees have uplifted. Uh, they really destroyed that. Yeah, people are still in those bricks. Oh. Um, <laughs> Yeah, they walk <laughs> off. They got little legs and they take off. Running. Oh, really? Okay. Thank you. My husband had one when I moved to Greeley, and I was like, "How do you have one of my bricks? <laughs> <laughs> You're not even from Trinidad." <laughs> uh, the next item is the Tri Children's Museum concrete that's in the rear of the building. We uh, we talked about fixing that, uh, and it's in bad shape back there. And um, who's the owner to? To the north, Mike, the brewery, that who butts us on the north side. Yeah, the paradox. Yeah, paradox. That so they're wanting to do improvements, and we told them we, if they did, we would fix our portion of it. You know, so um, on that same building, uh, we got to replace the doors. They're they're basically falling apart. The old uh, and since it's a historical building, they have to match that look, whatnot. I wish we could go in with an overhead door, but right now they're two big bipole doors, and they're heavy, very heavy. But can we did find in, a company that does do that. So can you put in for from the state of Starkville fund to replace that? A grant? I think we can. We should be able to. Mm -hmm. yeah. I thought we had approved money for that at some point, didn't we? We did. Out of marijuana uh, allocation. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, might have been pre-COVID, then the, the door manufacturer we had um, right. never came through. I knew we were having a hard time finding somebody to do it, but right. I thought we had allocated a little bit of money for that. Yeah. We'd get the state to pay for it. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Just, is there any, uh, this might not be a question for you, maybe Mike, but is there any plans to use, utilize that building a little bit better than the children's museum? That I do not know. It's got a major step up into the building. Um, if we yeah. do something, it's going to trigger a lot of work. Yeah, it's never <laughs> mind. <laughs> that, that would be great if we could use that, because that's where all the action is at. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, the city owns a building there. It's just kind of sitting there. So yeah. like, there's probably a lot of uses for Could be. complete ADA compliance. So if you change absolutely anything, complete bathroom, everything inside. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
Um, the next one, accessible pedestrian signal upgrades. I think we've already gotten you know, we got the grant, we got the grant on that. So, same with the, the next one. Same with the bike lane striping. So, uh, excavation cut, concrete cut projects. Uh, we have, the city has sidewalks out there that are either missing a stone or it's in bad shape. And we're trying to put together a little concrete project to go through and, and correct these areas. I talked to Mike on Friday. I was amazed just right down there. If you go from the, the roundabout, it doesn't matter which direction you go, we have ADA, can, ADA issues. You head over the new bridge, I call it the new bridge, the one that co uh, comes over Nevada, over the river, there's an inch and a half step where a stone is, and like Mike said, CDOT's not gonna fix it, they're gonna point their fingers back at us. We have to do these things. Yeah. I had a lady call me the other day, I, I, I've never seen a lady in a wheelchair, but. At the end of the conversation, she was in tears. She goes, I can't get anywhere. I said, ma'am, I'd be more than happy. She goes, I can't even go out there with you today. I'm so upset. It wasn't our typical person that complains about ADA. This was a woman, completely different person. And after I got off the phone with her, I, I went for a little ride. And she's right. There's, there's issues there. And I just, it blows my mind with all that new construction that things move. Yes, there's a first part of construction, you know. So... Anyway, we probably maybe go in there, and it's easy, pop out a stone. We don't have that inch and a half lift there. There are people that go in and grind. We could check into doing that for, for these lifts on curb and gutter too, but most of the time it's easier just to pop the stone and replace it. So, so we're looking at that. Um, uh, we talked about river walk lighting. Uh, we're working with a lot of these departments. Uh, Talitha come to us, we got a distance. Uh, Dean Duran gave us some input on it. And obviously the, the project would be, uh, we would handle the administration through our office. Um, North Lake Dam Survey, that used to be done by understanding by a private consultant. Now that we have a, an actual LS on staff, maybe one of the guys I talked about earlier, we can do that in-house. I. Did ask him about if he would be okay with doing that. He's fine, so we can do that. It's just to control the dam. It's something that's required by the state dam engineer. I just want to make sure it's not moving vertically or horizontally. So, uh, and the last one, the river walk fence. Uh, Kalitha got got a hold of us about about fifty seven hundred lineal feet of a split rail fence going east down the river tr walk trail. So. I don't know much about that project other than we kind of gave her a distance and she's trying to get a grant for it. So um, we have a couple quote unquote shovel ready projects. Uh, this is up on Saddle Road. It's to take all the, right now the way the sewer comes out of Allendale, it runs down through the, the lower portion uh, back off of uh, those, that subdivision. <coughs> that's up below Allendale, uh, and it, we have a, a weak link in the system because it, it tends to flood the guy's basement all the time. And this would, this would divert the sewer into the, our new system. Um, when I say new system, the 15 inch line that was put in 10 years, 10 years ago, Mike, 11, 07. So yeah, it's gosh, time flies 14 years ago. Is that Pardon me? Is that the, the section that extends the, the, the line? Is that what we're talking about here? Yes, the, you know, the Eagle Rock, in order to right. do anything yeah. with that part of their deal, was off-site sewer. Um, nobody's doing anything with that, so uh, we, we had to do an in-house design. Maybe that it's a shovel-ready project. Is that something that we could have, did we try to apply for that through that uh, sets of program? Um, I, I think it was point of one. Yeah. Would this be also partially funded by the um, contractor? What the hell? The escrow from the yes. developer? Yes. Yes. Cool. Yes. 
um, and we've had some conversations with uh, the bank and whether we, you know, they they are part of it, they, they own it. Uh, my understanding that it's under contract now, so we may have somebody uh, looking to develop that. So, and the person I talked to, I made him fully aware that we're holding 300,000 in escrow from uncompleted infrastructure on that. Excellent. That's an incentive to someone looking to buy at least to help with the monies. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then we have the five points. Uh, uh, talk about a, a roundabout there. There is one conceptual, or I should say there is one. The consultant provided about four or five different concepts, but one of them is completely designed. I'm not sure that's the one that we like. Right. So, um, so I wouldn't put a lot of emphasis on that. So. We've got a planner on board now. So you can... <laughs> <laughs> that's right. I, yeah. I met Sky a few minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> He's already needing another notebook. Kurt <laughs> <laughs> uh, Projects. Uh, as you know, we're under the gun at the landfill, so we uh, we we sent out a, a short, uh, very short notice to get. Uh, we basically bid it to generate landfill cover off of the 35 acres that we purchased, and that's already been done. Uh, and it's still under the. When I say been done, the the soil gener the landfill, the, the dirt generation has been done, but the, we are currently. Uh, Utilizing MGM's uh, rental because part of that when we bid that project we had a dozer rate because we don't own a dozer An hourly rate on his dozer and we since have been utilizing his uh, excavator and as this is, as of this morning We're utilizing a couple of his tandem dump trucks to haul Dirt from that area that we generated to get it up on the field. We have three weeks to get that in compliance Because uh, we had a pretty uh, Heated discussion with the uh, Health department some time ago was so we're working diligently to get that in compliance. So, Mr. Alton, I, we, I had asked a couple of meetings back to get an approximate cost of equipment costs for the landfill, the upcoming cost. Did you did ever provide you with that? Uh, not yet, but okay. uh, like Bob says, currently we're all hands on deck mode, uh, we're breaking free. Utility and street and bridge trucks as we can. The, the deadline's looming, so uh, we're we're doing doing that. But um, yeah, our, our equipment out there is is older, as with all this so that that's equipment. Why I asked, well, yeah, what we would be what we're going to be facing with replacing with a new dozer, or gotcha. a good new dozer or whatever. With that yeah, and, and we're looking for council to see. Would you say we're ahead of schedule, on schedule? What does that look like? I wouldn't say we're ahead of schedule. I, I would say we, um, and let me add a little bit more. Last Tuesday, the day after our holiday, uh, we had a surprise visit from the health department. Joe Petrick showed up. And, no. Yeah. And I think it was good because I think they, after that discussion we had with them on the phone, um, I, I think they wanted to see if we were taking them seriously, and he was very pleased with the work that's been done. But there is quite a bit of work that still needs to be done. So, um, and that's why when I got with Mike and I said, you know, Mike, we need to really kind of ramp up now, and uh, got to go ahead and to to rent this additional equipment, and we're utilizing uh, city equipment as well. We have we have a tandem, uh, our own tandem out there. Uh, this water department has a tandem that they've been providing with their driver and then now we have two more so uh, we cut we got a good situation going now we're basically hauling did we allocate like three hundred thousand dollars to that is that amount of money sufficient yes all right cool yes. i think it's closer to 200 but and we're actually quite a bit under that you know good so to date just these are just rough numbers since since we brought on, MGM was the low bidder who bid this. I think uh, the first part of this to generate the fill was around 13000 And then through last week, we've only utilized $9,800 of rental equipment. So, yeah. 
we should be well under that 200,000 at the end of this month, even by bringing on these additional candidates. Well, if we start falling a little behind, we have some money to add some additional people if we need to then, because I, I would much rather, as I'm sure you have, see this project finish well ahead of schedule instead of on their timeline, because they weren't real nice. What was the they could be ugly. End of July. End of July is when is the deadline we're doing this. But I think uh, Joe was pleasantly surprised. Uh, we started off, and I, I told him, I said, Joe, we've moved over 6,000 yards out here since this all happened and placed it and whatnot. Because, yeah, I see that. It looks good what you've done, but 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 you but, still need to always but. get the rest of it. Okay. So we're, we're, we're diligent we're going after it, so... Um, Saddle Road 15 inch sanitary sewer repair. Um, that has been completed. That was completed last week, actually. That new system that we put in in 07 was never tied in like it was originally supposed to be. Don't know why. It came into the tie in manhole and it was a foot and a half higher than the, the invert of the manhole. So we put together a little project and RMS was a little bitter. It might have been the only bitter. And uh, he went out there and, uh, last week and, and did the, it's completed. So now the actual sewage that's coming out of uh, Allendale and is, picked, is put in that new 15 inch sanitary sewer line that comes down Santa Fe Trail. So that's a good thing. Yeah. Um, water system improvement, phase two, we're still working on that. We got the first two blocks done on First Street, had some additional funds and and it, we wanted to utilize all the money of the, of the grant, so we, we, they're pushing forward between commercial and convent. If we run short on, we'll utilize all the grant funds. If we run short, Mark has some additional funds in his budget to pick up the rest of that. So we wanted to take advantage of the entire grant. Um, and they're currently working on it right now. Um, Noah's Ark, yeah. This seems to be keep, we get excuses, excuses, but they're getting closer. That's all I can tell you is we're a lot closer to having that done. And, and a lot of the excuses are legitimate. I mean, I've had flags ordered for for weeks, and then I get a call because I thought I was supposed to have them three weeks ago, and they, now they postpone them to September. Shipping is a big deal right now, and that's what's happened out in Noah's Ark. They, um, they, for doors and whatnot, but um, we're on them, and we've been told that we should have a, a a July 25th completion out there. I'll believe it when I see it, but that's what we've been told, okay? So, um, curb cuts and sidewalks, those are those are ongoing projects, uh, back of construction and Cedar Ridge, uh, uh, you can see up throughout town. Uh, the only thing that I would say in the future when we let those projects, I want to see them be continuous. The, the, the way these, this first one went out, it was just they were the hopscotch around town. It doesn't make a lot of sense. I kind of like the Cedar Street project on the battery. You can see they it all went up. It's a continuous path, you know. And we're going to make sure on the when we let the next phase on. on Is the uh, the curb and gutter park, park Park Street there? How come that's the only area? That one curb and gutter over there on Park and San Juan. It's in our DOJ list, and it was, I. This was before me, and I'm not, and I'm not pointing fingers at anybody, but I think there was a priority system that DOJ had come down with, and their priority system didn't make any sense to me. I, I, like I said, I'm a big proponent of doing a continuous path. That is good. The one you're looking at on Park and San Juan, that is going to be a difficult one. That's going to be similar to the one at, on the lower. Adjacent, uh, going up Nevada, right. as soon as you go up Pine, you have to do a switchback. Anytime you have to switch back them, it, it's costly. You got retaining walls; they're just not easy. So, why they picked that corner out of everything that we need to do in the city, I don't know. Yeah, it was kind of strange. It's the only one in that whole area. Yeah, yeah. And then after that, I think we jumped to main and commercial. And you guys are thinking, "Geez, we just did a construction project," but unfortunately, <clears throat> they're not in compliance. At, you know, it, 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 it none just, of the ones on Main Street are right, right at Main and Commercial. Evidently, they're not in compliance. That's why we have to go back in and redo them. Oh, yeah. Wow. I mean, our, our constituents are going to see that, and 
they're just going to have to shake their head. But yeah. what are the issues, though? I mean, exactly. Well, the big, the big, the big issue is great issues. They, um, the, the ramp itself has to be under two percent, and that's where a lot of these are. They're over two percent. The cross slope on them. And those the landing pads have to be level too, right? Well, that got to be under two percent as well. Yeah. Um, and two percent is only a quarter inch per foot, so it's not. For the, best, for the most part, they are fairly flat. So it, there's a whole list. That's what that lady asked me the other day. She goes, are you seeking somebody in a wheelchair to when you design these? And I said, ma'am, no. I mean, we have a, the, the government has a set of specs that we have to meet, you know. And she, and she, goes, and she goes, you don't. You mean you don't want to listen to us? And I said, ma'am, I didn't say that. <laughs> I said, like, we have a set of design specs that we have to comply with. And... And I said, I'd be more than happy to go out there with these issues on the ones that you're having problems with. So that, uh, that way we can at least get them in our repair schedule, you know. So, hey, Mr. Just, uh, you know, when we did the space grade project, we had to come to an agreement with the housing authority on, uh, I'm not sure, uh, some curb guards or some stuff. Did we ever address those yet? Not yet. I think that was an agreement. That well, there was an agreement, and it was never signed. And, um, and then they decided that money they put forward and their HUD rules and everything they just backed off. But I didn't know if with that good. said, those are, will eventually be contained in okay. a whole uh, settlement. I just didn't want to yeah. go back on our agreement if it was still intact. Okay. okay. Yeah, <laughs> um, uh, water treatment plant housing addition that the project's currently being constructed right now. They're adding a, a approximately 500 and some square feet to the existing house up there. Um, the next one, the senior center man lift, that's been completed, that's done. Um, Sanitary sewer trunk line replacement phase two. For the most part, that's done. We were waiting for RMS to come in and pave their patch back on Linden. I think that might even actually be done. Um, Santa Fe Trail surface uh, surface improvement. That says trial. Um, <laughs> trial surface. <laughs> that's under construction. So. Um, that storm last week didn't help us any. It pushed a lot of our gravel out onto uh, Lower Santa Fe Trail and almost to Main Street. Mm -hmm. But we are actively working on that, and hopefully by the end of this month we might be real close. I don't, I don't think it's going to be done by the end of the month, but we should be close. Uh, then we have our flower project. Uh, uh, the Karen's actually uh, working on, as you can see throughout the city. On, I don't mean to interrupt, but on the Santa Fe Trail, when we signed that contract, this was phase two. Did we have an end date for that? We did. Um, I checked with Jenny, and I thought she said July July 15th was actually official end date, but we've had a lot of weather days that would add to that. The rain and everything. Right. Right. Why didn't we put weather dates in there? No, just kidding. <laughs> Trust me, I would love to. I, I leave that. City Hall twice a day and I go the wrong way going home. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the road's closed in front of you, So I was going to try to push this along to the yeah. past our lunch hour, and, uh, yeah. and then we also have to listen to the library and IT. So. Yep. Okay. So. Um, and then other projects uh, uh, that we've helped with, but they're not being overseen by engineering, is this, uh, the space to create. Obviously, we went out to bid, and the project that came in over the bid. And then uh, Carnegie Library, which is currently we, or it's under under construction, right? A landscape, yes. Yeah. The landscape will start this week. Mm -hmm. So we helped her out with just actually putting together the, the bid docs. So that takes care of engineering. There's a lot there. Um, there's three other departments that I have. I don't know if you guys want to uh, go forward. Uh, yeah. well, we're gonna, we're gonna, we have a list. Next is our library department, so we probably ought to skip those. That's fine. 
Uh, we, that's fine. Uh, we did talk about the landfill, which is at the bottom down there. And you're right, we do need equipment out there. And, you know, me and Mike talked about this in our one-on-one -on -one the other day, but really on Americana Road, with that million dollar, million plus dollar and everything that's coming up, we just really need to see something pushed on that because we're going to be at risk of losing that million plus dollar ground to get that through. Okay. And if you recall, point. that was... Uh, negotiations where the developer is supposed to bid that out, and we've been pounding, pounding them. Yeah. Um, the, I was told by their project manager that after next week he will be all on that because right now they're sister blood. I know, right? I know, yeah. So, but I agree, you know. No, and I just want to, I know we had talked, but I wanted to bring that a little sure. bit to the attention. Yeah. Right. Okay, let's go ahead and hear from the library, library since. Thank you, Bob. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank great, great report. A lot going on. Well, I didn't know if I was going to be here just a few. It was nice, though. I got to hear everybody's five plans. I even got an interview with you Wednesday. I, I know. I even got scared to go to this year. And I got to see everybody's faces. I haven't met everybody. See you guys. Have a good day. All right, thank you. you too, Bob. Rich says he thinks he got it, but I told him I need them off for sure. So, because I texted him, he thinks he got it. So, thank you. Yeah, right. Thank you. Yeah, everything's good. Wow. Thanks, Bob. Thank you. See you. Yeah. I'm incensed. Yeah. Thank you, man. You are welcome. I have a PowerPoint, but I'm not going to plug it in. I'm just going to talk really quick <laughs> since everybody's hungry and ready to go. Um, when I was asked to do a five-year plan, I didn't have a lot of information to go off of since I started on October 26th. So I kind of just took a small amount of time to kind of look at what the library does, what people think about the library, and what needs to be addressed in the library. And so COVID kind of gave me that chance. So it's kind of nice. So the first thing I wanted to look at was collections. Um, the library is, I mean, it's a magical place. You go in and you go and get your books and you bring your kids in and you want to make sure that you have an updated collection. We do uh, have a system, it's Aston Cat, and we're able to borrow from 100 different other libraries. But I wanted to make sure we have the collection that someone just comes in and they're able to grab that book. We're able to talk to the schools and they can come in and get their books. Mm -hmm. So the first thing I noticed was our young adult collection, which is our teens, was downstairs in the children's room. And um, teens is, they're big for me. I love the, teen, the teens, I love the teen collection. But as a teen, nobody wants to go downstairs. They don't want to go down where there's a big, beautiful tree house. But to them, they're going to the baby center. They don't want to go down there. Um, you have adults who like teen books. And I also wanted to bring adults out of the children's area. I need them upstairs. Um, so I immediately, we moved the young adult section upstairs. Um, we bought new books. So they're, they're up there. They're, they're, they're good. It's, we have beautiful new books. We have just a section just for the teens. So you come in. You don't have to go downstairs. Um, so we kind of bring that up. Another thing that I noticed was a juvenile graphic novel section. Um, that collection is very popular with the kids and it ranges from preschool to teenagers to adults but it is a great way to bring your reluctant readers um just kids they love it they're they're great you have your pictures you have your um their non-fiction books you have your history books but they're all done in graphic novel format so i i developed a great juvenile graphic novel collection and I used all of our state grant funds for that so that we didn't have to worry about where's the money coming from. We had money set aside for this. And so we have a collection down in Children's. Um, they have checked out over, 
Did I not write it down? I think we had over 220 checkouts in January of the juvenile graphic novel collection. So it's one near and dear to my heart. I have a nine-year-old boy who he will check those out all day if he could. <laughs> so we are updating all of the collections. Another thing I noticed was our holiday picture book section. These are your, your teachers want your holiday picture books. You go to a Head Start, and they, they want to do themes. They do theme story times. Our collection was old and outdated, so um, we're pulling a bunch of those, and I'm making sure that we have a bunch of fun, beautiful graphic picture uh, books that have all of the holidays, and also a diverse collection. We're not just having Christmas books. We're not just having um, Halloween books, but we're looking at other what other cultures are there? What what other holiday books are there? They're not there's not just one holiday. Um, and I talk fast, and I also know I'm trying to get out of here. Um, and I'm trying to get staff trained so that everybody is able to get someone to the right book, even if it's not a collection that they're familiar with. They don't like graphic novels. They don't like picture books. They don't like history books. They need to be able to be trained to help anybody at any point in time. I also changed where we were buying our books from. We were buying our books mainly from Amazon, um, which is, it blows my mind. They're in, we have a place called Ingram, and they are, um, under the Colorado Cooperative Purchasing Agreement, they give all public libraries a 19% to 40% discount on books. And a lot of those books that you're buying off of Amazon are coming from Ingram. They're coming from their stock, their, their warehouse. And so I immediately made that switch because we can't afford that. We don't want to spend Amazon prices even though they look good. We can get them cheaper from Ingram. Along with Ingram, they also send you hand-selected lists. So it's not just me or Sierra or someone trying to pick that collection, um, just because we all do have biases. They send um, us lists on what is, what, is, what is on the New York's best time seller. They have reviews. Um, so we're getting a really good... We're getting training on what, what to put in our library, not just what we like. Um, facilities. We have a beautiful old building. I love it. <laughs> I grew up in that building. Um, but it is an old building. Um, so one thing I looked around was I wanted to remove all the old furniture. There was old stained furniture. Um, so I pulled that out. I want to repurpose the benches that were upstairs. They became more of a sleeping um, nook, and I, I, I wanted to take that and move them downstairs so that parents can sit down there and watch their children. There's not really good seating. If you're down there and your kids are down there, you kind of want to sit down in a comfortable spot and watch them play. Taking out those benches does open up a spot. Um, the library can't get bigger. <laughs> it can't get bigger, so we have to make do with what we have. So I would like to install cafe-style um, tables that are kind of where those benches were so that we have now... We've opened up some spaces for people to come in. They want to use Wi-Fi. They want to use their laptop. They kind of want to do some research. And so we kind of add some tables there. Um, and I have some prices on those. Another thing, and it might just be, I worked really close with the marketer up in Greeley, was signage. Um, we have a lot of things taped on walls and taped on the doors. And it's just not professional. <laughs> so I want to take down all of our tape signs and actually get professional signage that shows you What's in that collection? Is it a biography collection? Is it, you know, you're in your fiction? Is it A through Z? Um, but yeah, I just kind of want to get rid of all the papered, taped signs, and that might be her personal. <laughs> um, as I walked through there, the carpet is atrocious. It smells, it stinks, it's old, it's dingy. Um, I think the perception then as you walk into the library is I don't want to go into that stinky building, and a lot of it has to do with that carpet. So I would like to pull it up and um, kind of redo that so that we kind of rebrand what, what does the library mean. We don't want to go into the old stinky building. We want to go into that beautiful building with books. Um, the next one, which is happening, was it was one of the first things I noticed was the landscape. Um, there were some bushes. Um, it became very overgrown, and I'm sure it was beautiful when it was installed, but at that point, I was having safety issues. People were hiding behind bushes. They were going to the bathroom. Um, staff felt uncomfortable walking out the back door. And so, and thank you, with the marijuana funds, it did get um, pushed through. So we do have the landscape. So we worked with, we got down the big tree, which was causing some issues on the sidewalk and also 
I'm hoping not the foundation, but we were having a leak as well. We have a leak down there. And so all of the bushes got pulled out, and we sent a bid out, and only one, I sent it out to Canyon City, Pueblo, I think to New Mexico, and only one company responded. So I don't, it was Terry with Western Rain. So he officially starts pulling everything out and start working on it this week. So he submitted his design. It's beautiful. I think it's going to work. He tried to give me what I thought was probably very confusing directions. If I want a very beautiful landscape, I want an uninviting but inviting landscape. <laughs> and I also want colors. Um, so he's, he's trying to work through my very specific request um, so that we can get people to drive by. We have visitors and tourists come in and look at that Carnegie Library. And we don't want them to feel like it's just overgrown and... They want it to be, they drive by and they see this beautiful building with this beautiful landscape. So, I have a question. Ask. So we had to move that tree. Yes. Is your landscaping going to take care of that area too? Yes. And so he had planned for, he had in his design, he had planned for beautiful bushes and trees that are going to go there that the sun will actually be able to catch because that tree was going to, there wasn't going to be anything that can grow in that district. And he is also going to put replace trees. There's not going to be, I think there are, I don't have the list. I think they're coral berry trees, maybe. They're smaller trees. They're not going to become so big, but they're still going to be a tree on that side of the um, The next one, it's big, is technology. Um, Trinidad needs, they need help with computers. Especially when COVID hit, you have people who are out of jobs. They don't have access to a computer. They can't afford Wi-Fi. Um, so where do they go? They go to the library. The library right now has four computers. Um, we only have two in use because we're trying to maintain that six-foot distancing. Um, and we need to do computer classes. We need to help people get computer skills. Um, computer, how, how do they get jobs? Um, how do they start their business up? where the place they go to. There's not enough space in that building. So what I have looked at is, I mean, I love that table. I grew up with that table, but there's a beautiful old historic table that I would like to shift and put computers on and then open up that space to be a computer commons area so that we can actually have all the computers in one spot. I think the previous vision was to have a tech room, but it's downstairs in a very, it's not a good spot. You can't see anybody down there. Um, yeah. I would like them all to be in one location. So staff is able to look up at a glance and see how many computers are available. How can they help people? Um, I mean, one of the problems that I've heard is that some of the homeless people have been going in there and taking up the computer space and just staying there and staying there and staying there and half of them were sometimes we're even asleep. Yes. So I don't know if you've kind of taken care of some of that limited, uh, limited time for you, computer use. Uh, those type of things, I think, would Absolutely. So in that plan, actually, is, um, so the computers right now, we have an hour limit. And we only have two computers, so it's easy to monitor that. What I'm looking at is a computer reservation software, because if we add eight more computers, 12 computers altogether, it's going to be a lot harder to say, okay, Bob over here has been on the computer for an hour. He's been on the computer for 45 minutes. This takes it out of staff's hands. So you're, they're able to go make a computer reservation. After their hour is up, it shuts down. Um, people can make reservations and come back and say, okay, I have this computer at 345. I know exactly I can come back here and I can use that computer. Can you manually shut these down if, if somebody's just sitting there not even using it? Absolutely, them? yes. And so you can go in and so you have access as staff to shut down a computer. If you see that they're doing something inappropriate, you can send a message and shut it down. And so, yeah, so I've looked into the pricing for that. Um, I'm working with James with IT on getting estimates for additional ports and electrical outlets because that's that's big is trying to figure out how do we add ports, how do we add outlets to this building in this floor right here. Um, we talked about going from the basement up because all the electrical ports are alongside the wall and not all of them work. So we don't want anyone to have tripping hazards if we have computers down there. Um, as we add more computers, we're going to be able to offer technology classes to the community. And so um, we are continuing to do one-on-one -on -one appointments at the moment. And so people call. They schedule a time, and they can come in, and we'll work one-on-one -on -one with them to 
what do you need help with? Unemployment, um, applying for a job, resume creating. Um, some people just want computer skills. They're like, I don't even know how to use them. Most. And so we kind of work one-on-one -on -one with them. Um, we're going to continue doing social media. Um, that's huge. Um, we have, oh, I have the list of how many people we have, but we do have a big following right now. So it helps get our events out and all that information out there. A big thing that I noticed also was I need to change the perception of the library, and along with that is branding and marketing. So we don't have a logo. So we don't have, when we go to outreach events, we don't have anything that says this is the Carnegie Public Library, that they're going to recognize our logo. The city has a logo, and it's, but we need to make it very specific to the library. Um, we would like to incorporate... Um, the brand standards that the city already has in place so that we do send out, when we're creating flyers, they all look very, they look the same. They're not willy-nilly. Um, I'd like them to look very professional using the same colors and fonts. Are um, you utilizing the library uh, commission to develop to come up with something like that? No, so that was, I didn't, I didn't even think, you mentioned that earlier and I didn't even think about that. I had just reached out to someone I knew who did graphic design and was like, what is, what does that cost? How does it? How much does it cost to get someone freelancing doing a logo? Um, and so we put a pin in it because of summer reading, and it got a little bit busy. But, but I think your commission should also have some good input into that. Too. Okay, perfect. I can do that. Um, but yeah, so if we did marketing and we market correctly, every single positive interaction, every resource provided, and program attended will build loyalty to the, to the Carnegie Public Library and increase our usage. Um, I'm really looking to get those kids. Um, if you you get the kids, then you have your adults. And that's that's my focus. Um, I have an early education degree, and so the children, that's we're working with the schools, and we need the children back in the library. I'm working on policies and procedures. Um, we need to have policies and procedures to provide equitable treatment for all um, because we don't want to treat someone differently because of their social economic status or because we think that they need the library more. Everybody needs to use the library equally. Um, and then it also establishes the standard for services. So staff needs to be trained on the policies and procedures so that they know they need to treat everyone the same. Um, along with that is the patron code of conduct. Um, it's done and it's nice, but I'm, I'm building on it. And it's, I think, just even hearing about what have been some of the problems in the past. and so. We're kind of just, I mean, it might be overkill at the moment, but I think it's, you kind of need to spell everything out. Um, I am keeping the no food, no drink policy, um, especially if I get new carpet. <laughs> I would prefer that it's an old building. They don't, I'm, I don't want it to, we want to keep it nice for everybody. Um, there's going to be policies about sleeping on the floor. Um, no, that's a tripping hazard for one. Um, there's no... There should be no adults in the children area unless they're with a parent or with a child or it's a teacher or someone coming in to pick up children's books. But we don't need to just be hanging out in the children's area. So I'm working on those. I'm working on incident reporting. Um, there needs to be a standard for reporting. So it isn't right now. They do. They do have an incident reporting, but they write it down on a piece of paper and then they put it in a big folder. <laughs> and then, so if I have some patrons who have been banned, I'm trying to go through all of those to find out why have they been banned. If a lawyer comes and asks and they have a case against us and they say, why has this person been banned? You took away his rights. I'm going to have to try and find out why he's been banned. Um, so I'm trying to make that a little bit easier to track. Um, and also That's create... what he said. <laughs> what? Sorry, they're all saying damned lawyers. <laughs> <I know. laughs> yeah, sorry. <It's... laughs> but then I'm also creating a process for why we're suspending people and why we're banning them. Um, and I, nothing was consistent. So I'm going through all these incident reports and there is this one patron who's been in there a lot of times but never got suspended or banned. And then this person got banned and there was two incident reports. And so I'm like, no, we need to be very consistent. Are they banned because um, I have a rubric of why they would be banned and then are they suspended for one day, are they suspended for three months? What is an appeal process? We don't even have an appeal process in place. So if they get banned, how can they appeal that? And so I'm creating that so that we have all of these in place and these lawyers don't come back in us. Yeah, yeah. Keep lawyers out of your life. <laughs> but I, I, we have to think about that. We have to think about someone coming in and saying, 
Um, and so you have to make sure you have you have your process in place and you followed your process. No, you're bringing very some very eye-opening things that I've never thought of, and I'm yeah. sure a lot of us have not heard. So, thank you. It seems like you're looking at things at a very broad perspective. Good, thank you. You're welcome. Um, we also have a security camera use policy in place that was very important, especially with public libraries. There is a Colorado privacy law, um, and I wanted to make sure that we were not violating that law and that people need to know why the cameras are in place, who's watching the cameras, who has access to those cameras. And so, so Jessica, do you, you handle your own disciplinary issues, or do you have a sergeant at arms or somebody else there in case things get out of hand? Um. <laughs> <laughs> You go across the street. No, the I, 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 have, I, I'm from here, so I probably oh, I have some right sort now. of like, I, I go out and I take care of it. But I'm sure I would have no problem calling the chief if something happened. Or, um, you never. I haven't had anything besides I've chased people out for doing drugs. Yeah. Um, that's probably my big one is drug use, um, inappropriate use of the facility. Um, and so, well, that's grounds for calling the police. Yeah, the and police. I should. And it's just one of those moments where I just storm out and I'm like, get off. <laughs> I'm like, you need to stop whatever you're doing Do you and have, you have to go. I'm not sure if it would be necessary, but you don't have time to have an emergency button to go to the police department. We do. Please. We do have one. Okay. Um, programming. Um, we, we're coming off of COVID, so there wasn't a lot of programming going on. So we're coming back up to speed. We did get some of our reading um, program up and running, and we planned for everything outdoors, which leaves us up to those weather elements, but we've kind of worked through those things. Um, we have over 97 kids registered for the summer reading program. I changed it to be all online registering this year. Um, I wanted to be able to track the numbers, um, and everybody has been able to register. Nobody's complained. Everybody has liked the online registering. I'm going to be able to pull reports. I can send out mass emails to everybody who's registered for the program. And so far, it's been good. So I think we'll use that for further programs as well. Um, we did get a CARES Act grant. And I have to highlight this because it's very important to me, is we did buy a database <coughs> called Yale Presents Udemy. And it has over 4,000 online classes to help with education, personal development, business, technology. And they're free. All you need is a library card. And so... It was one of those, how do we help people get back into the job force? Um, do they need to learn how to use Microsoft? Do they need to learn how to use QuickBooks? Because they want to go into some financing field. Um, and along that note, we also received, um, or I purchased Cypress Resume. That was our number one one-on-one -on -one help, was I need to create a resume. And creating a resume on Microsoft Word makes me want to scream. <laughs> Trying to work with formatting, it's horrifying, especially if they already came in with their old resume. Um, Cypress resume, you just enter in everything, it populates it for you, and then you say what job you're looking for, and then it gives you keywords that you're going to want to add to your resume and your skills and abilities. So it creates a professional resume in like 15 minutes. <laughs> so if anybody else wants to go update the resume, please use this. Yeah, I I'm, I'm on the yeah. <laughs> Well, I... I, I was hired in Greeley in 2007, so that was like my last resume. <laughs> so, yeah. It was one of those moments of like, oh my god, I have to create a resume. Um, but yeah, so it's one of, I liked that one. It's cheap, it's affordable, it's something we can continue year-round um, every year. Um, we had our summer reading. We did have um, our story walk. I don't know if anyone has taken a walk around Central Park. Um, so we created, and it was mainly Phyllis and Sierra, they cr um, we bought religious signs and then we deconstructed a storybook and then we placed it along the walk so people could read as they're walking along with their children. Or It's very nice. <laughs> it's very, very complimentary. Nice. Oh, yeah. it's, it's, very is it a good story? It's, I don't know. He doesn't read the story. And it I'm is a fabulous died. story. I I've <laughs> seen the pictures. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, exactly. <laughs> exactly, that's right. <laughs> and we received funds from the Bar NNI grant as well to help maintain that. Nice. So we're going to, I was thinking, it's going to cost to receive, to buy the books. I was thinking also, um, damage? 
um, maybe someone, there was already, someone had pulled out the sign and threw it in the lake. Right. Um, but I, just one sign. But just one sign, yeah. so I don't know yeah. what that was all about. <laughs> <laughs> so we're looking at different ways to do programming and how do we bring things out to people who can't come into the library or what's another way to remind people that we're here, we're still here. The story walk is meant to be movable, so in time I would like to one, get it in other parks or also my dream is to get it on Fisher's Peak on a hike. Um, and maybe do a scavenger hunt as well along there. So we have that. Community involvement. Um, like I said, the children are huge on my list. And so I would like to, COVID really put a kink in that, but I'd like to start working with all the local schools. Um, and how do we get out there? How do we, do we talk to the English teachers? What book are they reading? Are they required to do some reading? What can we do to help them? And so... Um, we're working with the businesses and nonprofits, um, Trinidad Youth Club. We they came into our um, summer reading kickoff event. So, what other places do things with children that we can we can work with? Um, and this one, it was just one I just added. Um, it's staffing. Um, without staff, the library would be just a building, and that's all. Um, and I would like to increase staff to include a substitute or on call person. Um, to kind of help, we have a small staff, but to kind of help when someone, I don't want to tell someone they can't go on vacation, or they call in sick, or they need to move, um, but that leaves us down to like one or two people in the building, and so it would be nice to have someone who can just come in and be help us, just be a body on the floor if needed. Um, I'd like to have a teen librarian. Right now that position is combined, and I think, I think the current employee has some strong strengths with the adults. And I think it's really hard to ask somebody who has strengths with an adult to kind of pivot and then think about teens because that's a very specific person. That's a very different skill set. Um, I, I love adult programming, but teens are different. They're a totally different animal. <laughs> you can't ask someone who's like very strong with something else to be like, and I also need you to get on the floor with these teens and find out what do they need, what do they want, and so it's hard. And then... I would like to add, if we ever get more computers or more, it was, would be additional circ assistants that are generalists. Um, right now, I'm working with a staff who has, this is how we've always done it. I would like to broaden that and be like, I need someone to be working children's. I need you to be able to, to be in the children's area. I need you to be able to get books. I need you to be able to help someone on the computer. And so if you open that job description to be a generalist, they're hired specifically to know that they are going to be doing everything, one of everything. Um, I need them to be able to help with everything, help with outreach programs. Um, my future future is outreach, and that's beyond the building, and that would be a, a bookmobile. Um, not even as big as a huge traditional bookmobile, but most currently and more commonly, they're called pop-up vehicles, and they use a sprinter van. Um, so something small, um, about like 57,000, I think, off the top of my head that you can retrofit to add, you know, your small collection and you go to your outreach events, you go to your schools, you go to the nursing home, maybe you just go to a park and you're just at the park, you know, 10 to 12, Mondays, every Monday, we're going to be there for you to check out a book. Um, but what that's size car do you have? <laughs> I have a forester. <laughs> I could buy some signs for that. Paste them on the side, yes. Yeah. But yeah, so we have that. And I mean, big dreams planning is we are getting bigger. Um, the community is getting bigger. We're having more people come in. We want it to grow. As I've mentioned before, that library will not grow. It is what we have. And I think we need to look at in the future, do we open up a second branch? A second branch that we can grow with. You, know, you do have a good vision for the library. Yes. Really thank you for it. Well. You're welcome. So I'm done. <laughs> so, uh, I really appreciate you know, the, the vision that you have. And like I said, you've invited me uh, to some of the stuff that hasn't been sound like that never been done that needs to be done. So thank you. I would want to add this without adding a lot more time. But I was on the library board when I first got on council. Some of the things that you told us today, never heard of the library board meeting. And I am so thrilled that you're in that. Yeah. So yeah. you have the, the right makeup of your people that are on your library board now that are you know, right along with your vision. 
tinkers in the car. What's the relationship between the library and books and more? Is there any relationship? Yes. So they are, um, they're kind of like a friends group. So they, all of the funding um, from the books, the sale of the books, they go in and they, they give us money to do programs. So they paid for our magic performer. Or I think they paid for other things for the history room before in the past. So they are able to give us money. Okay. And so, yeah, so they're very important, actually. And I know they're very scared that they're going to lose their building and space. And that would be heartbreak for us because that is a lot of extra money that we don't have to budget for. Thank you. Okay, I know that we're at the lunch hour, but also we have uh, the IT guy. I think he's here, too. He is here. I just talked to him. Um, why don't we all grab our lunches and he'll yeah. talk while we eat. Okay. While we eat. Oh, no. Thank you, Chelsea. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'll see you Wednesday, Mr. Devoto. How about if we just slog through? Can we do that? We're slogging. No, we're eating and slogging. You have to do it for an hour. Like, yeah, no, no. Just keep going. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Great. Thanks a lot, Les. Because you're bright on wishy tail fields in the world. Oh, I want to be able to get not much, how are you doing? Good? Going home now. Or not home, I gotta go to work. I thought so too. And Mike's like, oh, you're here today. I didn't find that too. I was like, I was like, Yeah, and then by this point, I'm already committed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought so too. That that when I asked Shauna, that is what I heard. Staff told me they're like, "No, you're there all day." How did you know only come in during your spot? Okay. Sorry. Oh, you're fine. Hey, you too, thank you so much. And I want to stream it. I need a good next to the bank of the West. I ordered seven of these. Uh, I what kind of in soap that is? Like, well, there'd be all sorts of stuff. What was that you ordered? Because if you hear what it is, you may not like it. What was that you ordered? I got sweet and sour. It's just, I don't want to be missed. I'm a chicken. Thank you, Audra. Yeah, thank you very much, Audra. Yes, thank you, Audra. Okay. Well, I'm going to be with those guys, so we'll. Excuse me. Does anyone want to trade four French fries or. That's a good one, well, he just kept flip flopping where he's been good. He wanted to do it at night. Well, yeah, 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 Okay. Yeah. Who wants yeah. ice tea, lemonade? Yum. Bring you drinks. You thought of everything, Audrey. Right. I always have help. So, well. Ned's got all your orders in, and Ned's got all your orders in. Yeah. 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 Yeah
We didn't get lunch for Tom Murphy. That's no, terrible. No, it's okay. I know. Sorry, Tom. It's okay. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> <You're not laughs> No, I thought like six hours without a meal. <laughs> no, you can't, Tom. Come here, buddy. Actually, you know, really bad spice. It is so different there, for sure. Oh, really? I actually just went home and ate it. Yeah. Good. We finally broke down. It was like, they have a pizza hut. We're going to order pizza. Yeah, we ordered pizza. We were in Mumbai. Yeah. Curry sucks on pizza. <laughs> I brought in this curry chicken pizza. It was like, it was terrible. Oh, yeah, it was great. <laughs> Gil the light on that side if it'll help you. Yeah. Good. Well, they're different. <laughs> 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 